oral history is something that everybody does in their everyday life. Um, around the dinner table, on the stoop, um, at the barber shop, wherever people are telling stories about their past, um, they're in a way doing oral history. Um, but, I continue, uh, oral history in the way that I'm teaching it is really one sort of formalized um, version of that everyday practice of oral history. Um, and so today I'd like to ask, um, what is the relationship between uh, oral history in the everyday sense and oral history um, in a more formal sense? Um, how, when, why, and to whom do people talk about their past? And what are the uses of this talk? Uh, people make history, of course, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and tonight, to focus our inquiry, um, I'm going to look only at cases where people make history, at least in part, to promote activism. Uh, and I'll present rather formalized modes of historical production, uh, not informal meetings or dinner table conversation, um, but for the most part, things that are self-consciously um, historical um, and even documentary. And so I'm wondering, um, by looking at these cases, um, what can looking at oral history as a particular kind of history telling within this broader landscape of talking about the past um, teach us about the sources and the deployment of the power of history to work in the world? And so in this paper, I'm going to use ethnographic fieldwork um, and interviews to explore these questions in a case study of one particularly historically minded intergenerational activist community, and that's squatter in New York City. Uh, so squatters occupied uh, abandoned city-owned buildings in the 1980s and 90s and defended them for decades uh, using a range of tactics from barricades and booby traps to phone trees and petitions. They're now navigating a process of legalization as their buildings are converted into low-income co-ops and they become homeowners. And so this is some of the media coverage of that process. As their squatter selves recede into the past, uh, these now former squatters have been busily documenting their own history, creating a museum, building an archive and a university library, doing oral history, and sharing their experiences with a new generation of activists. An ethnographic study of this complex landscape of historical activity allows me to study oral history practices, as I mentioned, in the context of other kinds of talk about the past. And I'll use this case to illuminate the particular power and the particular challenges of oral history as a way of talking about the past. So this paper will compare three very different uh, contexts in which former squatters talk about the past with the aim of promoting and supporting new activist projects. Uh, the first is a series of political education lectures organized by a direct action group. The second is a walking tour of squatted buildings. And the third is an oral history project aimed towards producing a book. So I'm going to use Alessandro Portelli's uh, oral history as genre to analyze how oral history works in the context of other genres of history telling to transmit activist memories. Uh, Portelli, who is most of you know as an Italian oral historian, uh, trained in literary analysis, whose uh, very influential work on analyzing oral history and narratives as both historical and literary texts has really shaped the field of oral history. Uh, and so he argues that in history telling, as opposed to storytelling, uh, the speaker is not a member of the listener's immediate circle. So there's a process of mutual exploration that goes on there in an oral history or other kind of historical genre that doesn't happen when someone's telling a story to someone that they already know. The interviewer then becomes an especially active listener. Uh, they ask for people to explain the implicit. They ask directive questions. Again, not things that typically happen in an everyday storytelling encounter. And storytelling um, tends to tap existing outcropping memory um, where history telling tries to reconstruct things that might not be quite so much on the surface of our consciousness. Um, so participant listeners in a history telling encounter will prompt, um, tell me about the time when, um, or add information. The end of most history telling is a text or recording, and so all three cases that we'll look at today are basically history telling genres, um, but only the final slides oral history project um, is really oral history in the sense that we're used to talking about it. Uh, in that it results in a written text and a preserved document. The others are more fleeting oral performances of history telling. So in comparing and contrasting the three cases, I'm hoping to contribute to our, to our understanding of oral history and how it works in the world. And I'd like you to please indulge me in one more brief uh, introductory detour uh, before delving into the cases and talk for a moment about how this fits into anthropological scholarship. And I'd like to explain why I think it's important uh, to do an ethnography of oral history. So anthropology, as uh, many of you may know, has pretty much always used like history interviews as a research methodology. Um, and anthropologists have published oral biographies of their subjects 
throughout the 20th century. Uh, but I'm looking at how anthropology has studied rather than used oral history. Uh, anthropologists have also had a long interest then uh, in oral traditions and storytelling. And with the turn towards studying industrialized society uh, in the latter half of the 20th century, interest in the practice of history as an ethnographic object has grown. And so I'm primarily inspired in this work by two interrelated bodies of literature. Um, the first is the anthropology of historical production, um, building on the work of Michelle Rolfe Trio, um, whose book, Silencing the Past, um, is a work of trying to understand how history works by examining the process of the production of specific historical narratives, um, starting with the production of sources. Um, he also asks us to look at studies where his history is produced outside of the academy, so acknowledging that school teachers, uh, PBS producers, uh, local historical societies all produce history in the same way that historians do. And an ethnography of oral history is clearly an important way to do this. Uh, Trio asserts, um, perhaps most importantly, that uh, power is constitutive of the story of history, meaning that power is not uh, something that's sort of outside of uh, the process of making history, but that it's infused into every step of the process. Um, and so I find that useful in analyzing the cases that I'm looking at today. Um, I'm also, um, and this is the last bit of introductory uh, talk, interested in the anthropology of archives and building off of that work. So um, this uh, it's sort of a trend of reading archives ethnographically and looking at archive, archiving as a process rather than archives as just things or collections of documents. Um, and that's primarily known through the work of um, Anne Stoller. And then her students have moved on to an ethnography of archival production and documentation. Um, Penelope Papaleus on the right here is one of those students who's really inspired me with her work, looking at different ways that um, history is produced in uh, Greek society in the, uh, in the last 20 years and uh, how power works in those contexts. So um, I'm doing an ethnography of oral history in the context of a complicated landscape of historical production to illuminate how history works in our world by looking at specific sources, the oral histories and the oral narratives, um, and how they're produced and circulated. So on to our cases. Uh, the first is um, <coughs> the uh, political education meeting of a direct action group. So the group is O4O, Organizing for Occupation. Um, and it's a group that was created in part by former squatters in New York City, uh, with the goal initially of building infrastructure to support the development of a squatting movement in response to the 2008 housing crisis. So um, people saw that um, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there was a housing crisis in New York City, a lot of abandonment, and the squatting movement seemed to kind of arise almost organically in response to that moment. Um, but in 2008, when there was also this crisis of foreclosure and abandonment, that didn't seem to be happening. And so this group formed to try to build the infrastructure that was um, already there in the 70s and 80s, as they saw it, to make that happen again today. They now describe themselves as a group of New York City activists from diverse backgrounds that have come together to fight for the human right to housing through direct action. And so that includes um, squatting, and they're actively engaged in um, squatting buildings and chains in Brooklyn right now, um, and also things like shutting down foreclosure auctions, um, but still disobedience and singing. Uh, so the meeting that I'm going to talk about is part of a series of, historic, of um, political education meetings that they held over this past summer. It happened on a very, very hot uh, July evening at the height of, I think, New York City's fourth heat wave at that point at, at the Catholic Worker on the Lower East Side. So there was uh, Brenda Stokely, who was the speaker for the evening, in the center of a, a long conference table, and sort of concentric circles of people uh, coming out from that table and really filling the entire room. Uh, there's a couple of fans sort of stirring around at the edges of this mass of hot bodies and air, but a very, um, very intense atmosphere, and people listened carefully for a long time to her stories. Uh, so as at other O4O meetings I'd attended, the group was strikingly diverse. Um, there were new babies and grandmas, people of color and white people, uh, the hip and the earnest, the organizers and the organized, religious folks and anarchists, um, more than any other activist context I've ever been in, a group of people that looked like you just took you know, three random subway cars full of people and put them in a meeting together. And, and so Brenda Stokely, the speaker, uh, came from the 1980s anti-eviction and homesteading campaigns in Harlem. And this is one of the uh, documents that she brought along with her to share that history. And she started off by asking the group uh, questions rather than them asking her questions. So she asked, uh, who in this room is actively engaged in the struggle for housing? 
and, and who is personally engaged in the struggle for their own home. And so um, she asked one person who was personally engaged in the struggle for their own home to tell their story, um, which was very emotional. Um, she started to cry. There were uh, sort of um, calls from the people in the room of support and encouragement to her in telling that story. Um, and so she, she started this off um, by building a connection with the audience to facilitate telling her own story um, and to make that connection between the past and the present. Um, her lesson to the new generation was that organizing only works when it builds on the local leadership. Um, people don't need to be politicized, they don't need to be uh, convinced that their experience is political, um, they don't need to have uh, leadership. The role of the organizer is just to um, find out what the organic pre-existing leadership is in the community and support them in doing the political work that they already know and imagine. And the audience talked back to this point, and they did not simply accept this lessons in the past. Uh, many, of the active, many of the activists in the room seem to have had experiences in which it seemed like people did not think of their experiences as political. Um, in the 2008 <coughs> foreclosure crisis, many people experiencing foreclosure seemed to feel like it was their own personal problem, um, not something systemic, um, something that they should be ashamed of rather than um, up in arms about. And so she repeated her lesson in the face of this, uh, this sort of seemingly conflicting evidence that if people felt like people whose homes were being foreclosed didn't see their experiences as political, it was because they didn't understand those communities deeply enough. Um, and so this raises the question of how knowledge generated in one context in Harlem in the 1980s translates into another, Jamaica, Queens in 2008. Um, the storyteller here, Brenda Stokely, um, tried to draw parallels between her time and theirs, um, but they challenged that. And so um, this is a, a mode of history telling uh, in which there's a sort of active dialogue between people who are engaged in what seem to be similar processes in the past and the present. The second case is the Museum of Urban Reclaimed, of Reclaimed Urban Space, um, Morris, as they're called. Uh, it's a, another group that was started by former squatters and community gardeners. Um, and there might be some more chairs out in the... No? You okay? And you're welcome to come and sit anyway. Um, so it's started by former squatters and community gardeners and grew from the insight, um, mainly from a group of cycling activists, that after decades of direct action, um, a lot of it through um, critical mass bike rides, the landscape for cycling had completely changed in New York City. There were hundreds of miles of new bike paths, more and more people riding bikes, about to be a new city-sponsored um, bike sharing program. But when these big changes happened over the past five or so years, it seemed um, to most people like the government had just handed over these bike lanes, that they had just decided, oh, people need bike lanes and built them. Um, and the history of direct action and struggle um, that activists see as leading up to these changes was erased. And so, they decided that activists need to produce their own history and they need to do it uh, in powerful ways through things like archives and museums. Um, not just by telling it to other people that they meet, not just by talking about it in meetings, but by using these kinds of powerful institutional structures to spread it around. Um, and so this museum is a, a materialization of that idea. The physical space, and this is just a corner of it while it was under construction, um, is in a legalizing squat on Avenue C, um, C squat, and so the, and this is them making a sign for it out of mosaic. Um, the physical space is mainly a home base for the tours. It's small, it has some photographs and exhibits, um, but the real activity of the museum is taking people out into the neighborhood and talking about the history. As the tours are being led, um, the spaces of squats are starting to be hidden in plain sight. So whereas in the past, a squatted build building might have looked quite different from other buildings on the block, um, after the renovation process, they started to blend in a little bit more. Um, and so this is Serenity um, on 9th Street after an almost complete renovation. And you can see, you know, there's some little, um, little bits of, uh, you know, an unusual light shade here some uh, handmade railing here, but basically looks like a pretty normal apartment building. And this is Umbrella House, also on Avenue C, um, where you can see some uh, bits of an old uh, storefront bureau left behind, but the two stores that are there uh, in the storefronts now are pretty normal uh, everyday shops on the Lower East Side. And so the tour um, functions first to take people to the, to the sidewalk in front of these spaces, um, and show them for what they are, make that history visible in a way that it might not otherwise be. 
And so you then enter the building, and this is uh, Matt Metzger, who lived in Umbrella House, about to take the tour guide in. And you can see they've got their uh, mosaic preserved under a little bit of plastic, plastic or glass there in the front. Um, and this is the entryway to uh, Bullet Space, which is on 3rd Street. And you can see there's some uh, lovely mosaics there um, and a police barricade built into the door frame, which is sort of typical squatter architecture. Um, and so not only do you see the outside of these buildings, but as you can see in these pictures, you start to enter into the inside. And you go actually into squatters' apartments where they talk about their experiences. Um, and so this is a pastrami having a group of people into his space. This is Rolando Politi talking about uh, his past in his apartment. And you can see there's a lot of a lot of the tour goers are taking pictures, taking video, and producing their own documentation while they're part of this tour. And so when you go into a home on one of these tours, you might be asked to take off your shoes or go and ship so as not to disturb the resident cats. Um, you might get a tour of the space and a narrative of the construction. Um, this is Bill, one of the organizers of the museum, showing off his um, space age apartment and his amazing uh, kitchen cabinetry that disguises all of his appliances. Or you might be told rousing stories about the fight to defend the building. Uh, some residents are experienced speakers or amateur historians, and this is Maggie Wrigley um, talking about an archaeological dig that her building did uh, in their backyard. And others are unsure of what to say and seem to need a lot of coaxing from the tour guides. And so uh, the tour guide really functions um, in a way as a, a, an editor of a collective volume of oral histories in these stories. <coughs> I'd like to play you a little clip of Frank Morales, who's one of the early tour guides, um, talking about why they think it's important to give these tours. Today, we're going to visit uh, three or four squat buildings, and you are very fortunate because you're going to be able to go inside and meet some of the people who live there and look at the spaces and so forth. And that, that is something that we've just really begun to do. Uh, part of the reason being is that well, I guess, broadly speaking, to humanize the situation of people who are involved in squats, to make it more real for people. Um, as you know, squatting, maybe you're unaware of this, but squatting has, is often demonized in the press um, and so forth. So the message here is really from activists to a general audience. And the message is, look what we did. You can do it too. Um, because we're normal people, not just not just like you. We're, we're humanized through your experience of seeing us talk and entering into our apartments. And um, I'd like to play you a little clip that illustrates that. Here's uh, Frank inside a space that's under construction. Um, and what I'd like to note is that he, he talks about, he talks to the tour goers as you, um, bringing them into the project of squatting by the way he's speaking. You do, you do it collectively. So the question is, well, where do you get the funds to do this? Well, you know, if 10 of you took a building tomorrow, you'd be just like, okay, what do we, what do we have, right? You do benefits. Um, you go to lumber yards and ask for their damaged materials. And so he brings the audience into the community of squatting. If 10 of you took a building, what would you do? Um, creating a space in which people can imagine themselves as activists. Um, so as I said, the tour is really experienced almost as a chorus of orchestrated voices framed by the tour organizers. Um, it also can be seen as being like an edited volume where the tour guides are the editors. Um, it reminds me of um, public interviews in which people um, give their history not just to an interviewer but to an audience that's engaged, sort of like what was happening with Brenda Stokely. Um, so I'd like to play you an example of how the tour guides do this work of um, curating and contextualizing for tour goers. So this is um, Jerry the Peddler, a resident at Sea Squad, who's a very enthusiastic historian of his own. Um, talking about his experiences, and you'll hear just him sort of tailing off at the end of the story, a little bit of mic noise, and then you'll hear Matt jumping in to give us some context, and Matt's the tour guide here. Jerry opened up some of the earlier squats here. He lived up nice and got across from his park. Come up with racism for 1885. Right, what? Well, well. A4. Okay, it was, and we did the, we call it the Rock Against Reagan tour. We did. And so Jerry's telling his stories, and Matt is doing the work 
of um, bringing them together into a coherent whole. Jerry started some of the earliest buildings in this neighborhood. It was at this uh, time in the context of the Reagan era. Um, and so while this is, can appear to be sort of people uh, you know, speaking and telling their own story, it's actually curated and managed in really complicated ways by the tour guides and the tour organizers. So people are presented here both as living history and as people who have ongoing lives. Uh, their stories are extraordinary, their apartments are fascinating, but also you can be just like them. Um, and so the idea is to inspire new activists. And it's unclear um, at this point, I think, if it works. Um, initial evaluations of the tour seem to show that people are intrigued, they're inspired, um, but there's no evidence that they're actually inspired to act. Um, and I think that's partially because that's an extremely lofty goal, right? Uh, most people, uh, you know, it takes a huge amount to get people to become engaged in an activist project. Um, but I think that um, setting that as a goal is something that's worthy and something that um, this museum takes pretty seriously. So the third case that I want to talk about is more of the oral history case. Um, and so it centers around um, a woman named Fly. And here she is um, with her archives. Um, she's a longtime squatter, artist, musician, and writer um, who has massive personal archives um, that are uh, highly organized. And I've worked with her on doing this, although she had them pretty organized already. Um, and are now seeking an institutional home, actually, through Bookland, which is an artist book collective that um, in part provides the service to artists of helping them um, sell or donate their archives to institutions. Um, so this is her working with one of the people at Bookland to get the archive into shape for that process. Here's another piece of her archive. So she's created the, a squatter museum, actually um, previous to the Morris Museum that I talked about, in several iterations. Um, and in this work, uh, in part of her work as an artist, she's really playing with the tropes of anthropology, um, of studying and being studied, of explaining and being misunderstood. Uh, so I'd like to play a clip for you of her talking about how she thinks about this process. Um, and this is a, a photograph from a museum exhibit that, uh, a, a, an art gallery, I guess you would call it more, um, that was in bullet space at the time of their legalization from a show called The Perfect Crime, um, celebrating 25 years of illegality and getting away with it and becoming homeowners. So this is a piece of plywood with uh, um, trowels for, with roofing tar on it that they hung on the wall as a piece of art. And here's why. Yeah, I, I was really interested in, in presenting it as uh, kind of an anthropological study. And so I made little tags for all the objects, kind of like describing them in this way that you would describe like ancient artifacts. And, and these people would, you know, for my crusty shorts, I would like, I, I had a little card that described how these people would would sew their patches on with, with dental floss because what happens with the dental floss is that there's wax on it, and, and when you sew, when they wear the, the clothes and they're warm because you know you've got your body heat, and so it kind of uses the patches to your to your uh, to your fabric um, in a in a very crustly crusty way that you know crustaceous way that you know makes it more permanent and uh, and you'll be warmer somehow with all that wax and. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like it was kind of like a studying some ancient people yeah. because you know a lot of ways that we were living were kind of like ancient you know we had we were stones we had like you know crazy like like uh, crazy like setups for plumbing and lack thereof plumbing and you know peeing in buckets and having you know the squatter sink set up so the. For those of you who, who might not know, her explanation of why he was so patches on with dental floss is completely fictitious. It's a, it's a purposeful misunderstanding um, of squatter practices. And so she's playing with that in her museum exhibit in a way that I think is really um, clever and interesting. One of her other um, documentary projects that I want to draw attention to before we talk about her oral history um, is uh, called Peeps. And here's an example of one of them. Um, and here's her in the process of doing one. This is with uh, Stanley Cohen, who's the most prominent lawyer for the squatters. And she and I actually did this interview together. Um, you can see she's videotaping it twice, uh, audio taping it, 
Um, and it's, a, it's an intensive process of documentation in which she records an oral history with someone and draws them while they're talking. And then afterwards, they dictate words to her that sort of summarize uh, or tell a part of their story. And she writes them in the background of the drawing um, while they're talking to her. And so the, it's an interesting sort of hybrid genre between orality and writing because you have to talk as if you're dictating. Um, and you talk then in a way that's a little bit more like writing than if you were um, just talking normally. And so people talk very differently in the oral history interviews than they do um, in the peeps session. So um, this is a really large and long-term project she's engaged in. There's, um, I would say, probably several hundred of these done. Um, there's a published book, and mostly it's a collection of zines. Um, and public exhibitions that she does. And so the peeps are just the people that she meets in her everyday life um, traveling around. A lot of them are squatters, but a lot of them aren't. Um, and Stanley here is a, an ally to squatters. So um, why does Fly do all this documentary work? Uh, let's let her, her explain it. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the whole concept for, for a squatter uh, museum and squatter history, um, I kind of like had that idea even like way back in the day because I was always documenting and I always like I'm kind of naturally uh, you know a documentarian um, I always have been probably because I moved around so much when I was growing up you know and so I always wanted evidence of my existence <laughs> because like I'd be in a new place and be like am I really here <laughs> you know? and uh, and also like just just the idea of legitimacy, you know, this is a legitimate life that I'm leading, you know, I want, I want to prove it. And so the next phase of this process of legitimization um, is a book called Unreal Estate that she's working on. Um, it's something that she started, but that's being um, developed and um, created by a collective, and I'm part of that collective. Uh, the collective is called U Relic, which stands for the Unreal Estate Living Improvements Committee, but really the point is that if you're in this collective, you yourself are a relic, just by uh, being in the phase of life where you document your history. And so the book is going to include oral histories, um, but also essays, art, and artifacts. Um, and a, the section everyone's most excited about is called Unsubstantiated Wingnut Gossip, um, <laughs> where people will be able to um, give unattributed stories about their friends and neighbors and histories um, in a section that's going to be a really amazing thing for all, I think. And so the interviews are audio and video recorded, and they're transcribed, and they take the form of abbreviated life histories. Um, you know, starting off with how did you get to the Lower East Side, um, rather than you know where and when were you born, and tell me a little bit about your childhood. Um, but they do share an interest in biography. Um, and so Fly is really using the tropes of a positivist history in putting this book together. Um, she wants to know in the interviews who, when, where. Um, there's a timeline that's sort of the central product of the process right now. Um, there's a, a pervasive interest in who opened all of the buildings, and that sort of trickles down into contemporary um, conflicts over use and property, um, but something that she's very interested in, in documenting the history too. Um, and I think that this is in part because one major goal of the project is legitimation. Um, and so she wants to make a history that feels like a history. It doesn't just feel like people sort of chatting and casually telling stories. Um, and in these interviews, um, Fly knows most of the stories that she's recording. So um, Portelli said that in history telling, the speaker's usually not a member of the listener's immediate circle. But in this case, um, this is generally not the case. Often they're friends. And the interviews alternate between uh, sounding like history telling and really sounding like storytelling. Um, there's times when Fly is really mining <coughs> memory, trying to get the facts, and other times um, when they're uh, storytelling, ex uh, sort of exploring the outcropping of memory, as he said. So um, I want to play you a little clip that illustrates this. <coughs> um, this is an old picture uh, from the time that they're talking about of uh, Fly and Arrow. Um, and so this is an interview Fly is doing with Arrow. You can see in this section, the two of them are talking about the same amount. And this is about a, um, a sort of important episode in the history of the, the conflict over squatting in this neighborhood where squatters disrupted and took over a community board meeting um, at which some of the buildings were going to be transferred to a developer. That was like, you know, one of my sort of like defining moments of my time here. That was the summer of 1993. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and, and like I said, that was one of the defining moments of my time here because I was sort of like, you know, felt like I was the one who sort of like, like we had the plan to shut it down, but when it came to be that moment, it's like everybody was like frozen up and like you didn't know who was going to go or what's going to happen or what's going to, there was all these cops and there was all this, and, uh, and I was the one who jumped up and was like, no, we're not going to shut this down, we're going to, you know, or, or you're not going to vote, we're going to shut this down, blah, 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 and like, and like people followed. But I got singled out, I got beaten the shit out of that. You did get singled out, I was there, I was the whole thing. Yeah. And so, I mean, you were the one who stood up and said, like, I mean, there was silence. It was like a pin drop. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Even though there was like 500 people in the room, right? I mean, it was such a shock, though, because because there were so many more people to speak. Right. Right. And all of a sudden, the guy stands up and says, The public speaking time is over now. The public speaking time. Right. Right. Because the thing was that. Right. And I I said, No, you were not shutting this down. We're still going to speak, motherfucker. And we started up. But I remember Frank Morales was like the next one in line or something. Right. And he was like, yeah, Frank. And then, and then when they said shut it down, everyone's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Right, right, right. And then, yeah, so then you jumped up. And but then so, like, after you jumped up, I remember all hell broke, broke loose. loose. The was, smoke like, bombs, the, the, smoke the fire bombs, lines got pulled. Like, lights went off. Yeah, the yeah. yeah. I just remember seeing we, we were all yeah, locked yeah. arms. I had like um, that big Sean on my side <laughs> here, I think. And, you know, she used somebody on the other side. So these interviews that bring old friends together to reminisce about their past, in part, um, seem to function in one way um, to preserve the community that shares these memories, <coughs> uh, while physically their ties are weakening. So um, people, a lot of people have moved out of the buildings. Um, over time, you know, people travel and they don't all live together anymore. And when they do, they're not actively engaged in a physical struggle for their homes. And so they uh, don't have to work together as much anymore. And this community, even while it's rooted in place, is in some ways dissipating. Um, and so um, the interviews bring them back together. And I want to just play you um, one second to last clip of um, Fly. Uh, interviewing another person named Art Cabrera. Um, and they're talking sort of towards the end of his interview about um, how they feel they're seen by the outside world. Um, and this is actually a pair of uh, crusty shorts. You can see the dental floss, and the, they're not keeping anybody warm. <laughs> Most people were glad we were doing what we were doing, but they weren't about to move into an abandoned building. You know, I mean, you know, when you think about it, you know, if you can, like, be objectified and think about it. It's just this, like, kind of like this uh, irrational. You know, I guess it's I guess it's one of the kindest words I can use. But unless you live in in a you know in, in an organic living movement community, which the Lower East Side with all its squatting community was, with all its insanity, you really couldn't. You can't. You, I can't put words on. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I've never tried to explain my life to people who haven't experienced life in the Lower East Side. They, they either think I'm completely nuts, which you know I guess I am, and that's how I survived here. Um, and and they also they just they just don't get it. I mean, they don't understand, and they, they think I just moved into an apartment. Yeah. <laughs> and they you know they say things like oh yeah. I love New York City. Too. Yeah, right. yeah, right. No, you spent five years. I don't even, you know, most a lot of people I just don't even bother trying to explain. No. It because they, you know, a lot of times when I have, I, I get the look of fear in people's eyes yeah. when they fully understand you know, what I'm yeah. talking about. They think I'm just like insane way nut. Yeah, what are you talking? Like this insane way. political way nut. They get yeah. really nervous. Like I'm gonna. And, like knock them down and steal all their stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I want their apartment. I don't want your apartment. I just want a place to live. So we're Yeah. And so uh, you can hear how hear how both of them feeling like the world doesn't understand them can come together in this interview and talk very frankly to each other about that experience. And so the last thing I want to make about uh, the last point I want to make about the Unreal Estate World History Project is that recording the interviews makes a huge difference. 
um, the audio, then the audience can spread um, through these recordings beyond um, the people who are there to physically listen to it. And so um, in this final clip, we can hear um, Sly talking about who she thinks this book is for. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a lot of younger people. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of, a lot of like students of sociology and you know urban planning and I think the punk kids are gonna like it um, and um, you know anyone who's any kind of housing activist I think and you know anyone who's interested in New York history also um, you know maybe one day it'll be a textbook. <laughs> So we can see how, uh, to conclude, oral history, um, as seen in Fly's project, marshals this authority and this power of writing, recording, and archiving um, of capital H history um, for activist memories. It legitimates them in a way. Um, it makes squatting into a legitimate project by writing its history. And it brings these very intimate conversations between squatters into the public eye um, through the process of recording. Um, unlike the other public history telling modes in which squatters are speaking more directly to uh, a public of people who are not actively engaged in this kind of activity, um, these are um, conversations between squatters, as I said. So this transposed intimacy, I think, is a real strength of the process. Um, it shows, rather than telling, the experience of being part of the community of squatters. Um, and so I think um, any of us who have ever been involved in um, exciting and compelling activist movements can remember that it was that experience of being part of a community, of being engaged in something um, dynamic with momentum, um, of having that kind of intimacy that is often um, just as compelling as the, as the political goals. Um, that we can all see that there's a, there are reasons and things we want to change in the world, but the thing that actually makes people step up and do that is often a connection to friends. Um, so even the intimacy of entering someone's home is not the same as the intimacy of listening in on a conversation between old friends. Um, listening, reading the unsubstantiated, reading that gossip is like uh, eavesdropping on the most private of private conversations in which people don't even want their names used. Um, but in these cases, oral history's weakness is that it lacks the capacity for dialogue and challenge in the way that these live conversations do. And uh, because of the level of mediation, the kinds of conversations that happen between Stokely and the O4O activists, or between tour goers and squatters, doesn't happen. Um, and the kinds of um, really intense, scrutinizing, detail-oriented, how do you actually do community organizing conversations that Stokely and the O4O activists are having um, are of interest to people who are already actively engaged in these kind of processes. Um, and there's something that uh, happens live in a way that is difficult with the mediation of recording. Um, so I'm going to end there, and uh, thank you for coming and listening, and open it up for questions.